This day is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Do you ever think about switching insurance companies to see if you could save some cash? Progressive makes it easy to see if you could save when you bundle your home and auto policies. Try it at Progressive.com. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Potential savings will vary. Not available in all states. Hey everyone, Jody here with a quick word that we are rerunning an episode we did four years ago about Thanksgiving, the time that FDR tried to move the date of Thanksgiving in order to help the shopping season. Um, You'll hear right away that this episode is very dated to 2020. There's some reference to what was going on in the fall of 2020 right away, but I decided to keep all that stuff in anyway. It's a really interesting episode with one of our favorite guests, Adam Conover. So take a listen and happy Thanksgiving to all of you. We will be back with new episodes very soon. Hello and welcome to This Day in Esoteric Political History from Radiotopia. My name is Jody Avergan. This day, November 26th, 1939, was a few days after Thanksgiving, or maybe it was a few days before Thanksgiving, America was a little confused. And that is because in 1939, Franklin Delano Roosevelt had declared that Thanksgiving would not take place on the last Thursday of the month of November, but actually one week earlier in an effort to expand the holiday shopping season and boost the wartime economy. America, let's say, was not having it. We will get into the details, but the new earlier Franksgiving, as it came to be known, was very controversial. It did last for two years until 1941 when Congress stepped in and officially codified the fourth Thursday as Thanksgiving Day. But here to discuss Franksgiving, the perils of messing with the holidays and lots more is, as always, Nicole Hemmer of Columbia. Hello, Nikki. Happy Thanksgiving, Jody. Happy Thanksgiving to you. And our special guest is Adam Conover, creator and host of the excellent TV show, Adam Ruins Everything, and also the host of the wonderful podcast, Factually, and all-around skeptic and good thinker about our very weird country, Adam Thank you for joining us. Gobble, gobble. Thank you for having me. Yes. <laughs> um, so when Nikki and I were prepping for this, I was sort of joking a little bit about how this was an interesting moment where Thanksgiving had gotten politicized. And I made a joke about, oh, no one says happy Thanksgiving anymore. And it's, you know, the war on Thanksgiving and so forth. And I just actually, you know, this is a history podcast, but I want to start in the present because there actually is here in 2020 a little bit of a bubbling up of politicization of Thanksgiving, including Ted Cruz, who over the weekend tweeted a picture of a turkey and said, come and take it from my cold, dead hands. Um, So I guess, Adam, you know, it's a reminder that like everything can get politicized, especially in moments like this. I mean, everything is politics, right? Like human society is inherently political. Politics is just refers to the people of a society, you know. And so I've stopped a long time ago worrying about things getting politicized because they all are inherently. And if you look at history yeah. when people say oh no sports are getting politicized etc well if you look back through the history of sports there's they always were right they were been used th- that way since the beginning of sports and the same thing is true of our holidays and everything else so this is always in my mind a little bit of a false concern uh so yeah of course thanksgiving is political i mean the myth of thanksgiving as being this moment where the pilgrims and the native americans came together completely false it's a false history and it was created in order to create a false sense of uh, legitimacy of european colonization efforts that's what it was for and that was a political project so the thanksgiving that we already had was political as well so there's what are we talking about here is we need to be clear about this yeah and i think often it's not is it politicized but it's to what end and what are people's motivations and are, is it good faith and that's the real question to ask i want to get to some of the bigger your bigger thoughts on Thanksgiving itself. But Nikki, take us to 1939, 1940, 1941. Why in the world is FDR trying to mess with America's favorite holiday? To be fair, he was trying to mess with it in order to help America. It had been, you know, six to 10 years of economic depression and Thanksgiving, because it was falling on the last Thursday of November, that was the designation, was falling on November 30th. And retailers were freaking out because, again, the economy was weak. They needed the time for the Christmas shopping season. And they were worried that if the Christmas shopping season shrank, if Thanksgiving fell too late on the calendar, that they were going to miss out on the revenue from Christmas shopping. So they encouraged and successfully convinced Roosevelt to move Thanksgiving up a week. But he does this in like 
August. And there are a couple problems with it. One, people have already kind of started making their holiday plans. And two, colleges have already planned out their football season. And yeah. hmm. this is where <laughs> sports and holidays and all the politics come crashing together because universities get very upset about this. Yeah, pitting uh, shopping against football, America's two favorite pastimes. That's a really tough spot for, <laughs> <laughs> for FDR here. Um, but Adam, one thing that is interesting to me here, and I guess it's no surprise, but this lens of retail being the one through which a decision gets made, uh, this all reportedly started when the head of the Retail Dry Goods Association, a business lobby, called the Secretary of Commerce and said, hey, Thanksgiving is going to land kind of late this year. This is going to cut into the holiday shopping season. And I guess word got to FDR and he made this change. And it did at the time tap into this larger question of the Christmas season and the Christmas shopping season starting immediately the day after Thanksgiving and this whole idea of Christmas creep and the commercialization of Christmas, which is, you know, an ongoing conversation then something I think a lot of people don't don't really love. Yeah, this really strikes me is that in 1941 or, or so that this argument was being had about the the commercialization of the season as being this holiday time. Yeah, I mean, I, I've I grew up with my parents complaining about this, so I thought it was invented in the in the nineties. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I mean, so much of the time, our history, uh, you know, my favorite meta narrative in history to tell is always same as it ever was, because we always have the sense that everything happening is new. And the reality is, when you look back at history, you almost always find examples of the same thing happening. I'm sure as a historian, you know this, Nicole. Now, maybe that's overblown because you just because you can always find those correspondences doesn't mean that, you know, there that there isn't change and that uh, there aren't novel things happening today that mean, you know, today is different than the past. But still, it it surprises me every time to see that happen over and over again. Well, I think that the maybe the kind of new thing in 1939 is that Franklin Roosevelt was really working off a relatively new theory about the economy, which was that it was consumer driven. And mm. this really reflects his approach to the New Deal, which was in large part, get that money into the hands of Americans so they can go buy things. And that's going to boost the economy, which mm. relatively new in the 20th century. So I guess I guess we can tack that on as the not novelty of the 1930s. So that Marge Simpson justification for buying the Chanel dress, I don't know if you remember that episode, has always stuck with me my whole life where she's like, well, this is too expensive. I shouldn't just rationalize it. Uh, it'll be good for the economy. And then she buys the thing that she wants. Uh, that started with FDR, basically. He was the original Marge Simpson in that regard. That's right. I mean, I guess John Maynard Ken's is, but um, Marge Simpson mm -hmm. is the pure embodiment of that idea. <laughs> So, yeah, so it messes with football. Don't mess with football. Yeah, don't mess with college, college <laughs> As football. As a football hater, I know better than to mess with college football. I mean, look, they can't even be bothered to pay the athletes. They love it so much. You think they're going to change their schedule to suit you? Yes. I mean, we're seeing that this year, right? God forbid we change the, uh, the, <laughs> the Georgia LSU game because there's a global pandemic going on. My God. But other people do freak out as well, Nikki. People are inconvenienced, but it does become to use our favorite word, politicized, including Alf Landon, Roosevelt's Republican challenger in the previous election. He has this quote that kind of blows me away, but he says, more time should have been taken in working this out instead of springing it upon an unprepared country with the omnipotence of a Hitler. <laughs> so the, I, I actually don't know if I know exactly what, is, what the quote is. He's <laughs> either comparing this move, he's either comparing FDR to Hitler or he's saying this is going to make us weak and Hitler's going to pounce because we, we are now uh, don't have a firm grasp on when Thanksgiving is going to be. No, no, no. It's definitely the first. Comparing FDR yeah. to Hitler was not that rare of a thing. There was this accusation from pretty early on in his presidency that he was a dictator. And there were actually a lot of Americans who kind of liked that. They wanted a dictator. But remember, it's right at the beginning of the outbreak of World War Two, And Hitler, even though he's seen as this like massive threat, he you don't have Godwin's law just just quite yet in the late 1930s. But yeah, this idea that he was acting dictatorially, and this is you know the difference between something being politicized and something being polarized or partisanized. Like this becomes an issue because the Republicans and conservatives who oppose FDR and the New Deal are kind of grabbing on to whatever they can in order to try to take him down a few pegs. Well, and this sounds like a classic 
sort of reactionary issue, right? Someone is trying to change tradition, especially as relates to holidays, is just such classic red meat to a certain way of thinking, you know, and a certain, you know, a certain emotional predisposition that a lot of people have. Oh, no, not my holiday. You can't change my holiday. And yeah, I would also, by the way, uh, it would work on me. I would be <laughs> upset if someone tried to change the date of my holiday that uh, I had had every single time. It would be odd. And by, by the way, I'm sorry, can I just ask, what authority did Franklin Delano Roosevelt have? So you're saying that there was not an official holiday in the United States at all up until that point. So it was what? It was just a cultural holiday that was practiced out of habit by the people uh, without any, any top-down decision-making about when it would be. And so what— on what grounds did Franklin Delano Roosevelt say that he could decide when holiday was if it was not currently a federal holiday? So there was a little bit of federal oversight, which was just to say there was a tradition of presidents declaring it to be Thanksgiving. This really goes back it goes ah. back a ways, but it gets formalized in 1863 with Abraham Lincoln. But the actual like holiday date setting happened at the state level. And what you see happening is sort of a, a nullification crisis of sorts where states with conservative or Republican governments don't go along with it. So what day you actually celebrate at Thanksgiving depended on whether you had liberal Democrats in office or conservative Democrats or Republicans in office. And so many oh, wow. places in the country celebrated Thanksgiving on different days. Yeah, so 20, wow. 20 this is one of my favorite little um, quirks of this, is that now you have 23 different states and D.C. observe the new week earlier others did not and then colorado mississippi and texas went ahead and did both That's which is my favorite to tidbit <laughs> in all of this they that just said the we're best. gonna have it all we're gonna do both look yeah that is the best because look one year when i was in college i dated a girl who had family in toronto and so we had thanksgiving at my parents house on long island and then we visited her family in toronto and they have their thanksgiving oh i think it was the other way around i think their thanksgiving is a week earlier mm -hmm or thereabouts, and uh, so I got to have two Thanksgivings that year, and that was wonderful, because Thanksgiving is my favorite holiday, because the food is so good. Yeah. <laughs> so, everyone should be so lucky as this. Why were people complaining about this? You could... Be, you could have Thanksgiving in New York, and then what? Go travel to Indiana and have another Thanksgiving. <laughs> I think it's a great idea. Oh, right. Right. Well, yeah, so Colorado, Mississippi, and Texas, I mean, they just... I, I love their legislators just having this kind of, like... They saw the angle and uh, just had this one. I was like, wait a minute. What if? What if? This yeah. is the turkey lobby. The turkey That's farm right. lobby <laughs> was pushing for this. Hey, it's Jody. Uh, first off, I want to say thank you to everyone who has already donated to Radiotopia's fall fundraiser. And if you are listening and you haven't donated to the network before, you might wonder where exactly your dollars go. Well, the short answer is that it goes into making three episodes of this show every week. You hear the names of the folks who help make the program. Our researcher, Jacob, our producer, Brittany, Kaula, who does the transcripts, and of course, Nikki and Kelly and me. And I'm a big believer that people should be paid for doing that kind of work. Look, I want to be clear about something. No one is getting rich off of this show. But I've been proud of the fact that over the years, even as the media landscape has gotten rockier and rockier and we have ridden that roller coaster of ad dollars going up and down, we have still found a way to do it. And I'll be honest, there are months where it's really, really tight. There are some months where I don't come out in the black, but I still value making this show and supporting the people who help make this show. And I think it is important to keep plugging away paying people for their fair share and their hard work. And I can't say this enough. Listener support is a huge part of the puzzle that I just described of how we make it work. We literally, figuratively, metaphorically, pick your Ali, we could not do it without you. Really. So, if you can, take a moment and become a member of Radiotopia. You can do it right now at radiotopia.fm slash donate. It's tax deductible. And yes, there is a sweetener. When you do, you will receive a special curated playlist from Radiotopia that we put together just for you. It's very cool. Go check it out. Again, radiotopia.fm slash donate. And thank you. All right, let's get on with the show. We want to tell you about another podcast from PRX called Monumental. This podcast explores questions about the past, present, and future of U.S. monuments. 
uncovering the stories about what and who is important, as well as the stories that have been left out. Join host Ashley Seaford across the country with their team of journalists. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Tom received a presidential pardon. He's from Harrisonburg, Virginia, and has five siblings. Tom gets up at 6 a.m. every morning. He's an early bird. Because he's literally a bird. A 51-pound turkey, to be specific. Tom was pardoned instead of the thousands of Americans in prison for marijuana. And this Thanksgiving, the president will pardon yet another turkey instead of those Americans. Visit peoplenotpoultry.com to tell the president to pardon people, not poultry, this Thanksgiving. A message from the Last Prisoner Project. Look, not to get too high-minded here, though, but to go back to, you know, this idea that Thanksgiving up until this point happened just on a yearly declaration or proclamation, right? Ever since Lincoln, it was just every year it was expected that the president would do this thing. And then Roosevelt says, no, I'm going to do this other thing. I mean, you know, it is another reminder of that so much of what we consider our government is a norm and a tradition and not necessarily a codified rule. In mm-hmm. this case, maybe the stakes are slightly lower, but, you know, we've certainly been living through a period here where we've seen that you can – someone who just wants to buck those norms can certainly go ahead – and do so. Well, and you can see public opinion snapping back when those yeah. norms are broken. Well, yeah. I mean, speaking of polarization, there was, I'm seeing here, a Gallup poll in 1939 that reported that Democrats favored the change 52% to 48%, with Republicans opposing it 79% to 21%, which is a very wide margin. There's Democrats narrowly favoring it. Republicans overwhelmingly opposed to it. So, Clearly not a popular message overall, not a popular movement overall. What really strikes me about this, honestly, is that this sounds very much like a political dispute with an outcome that could have happened today or during the Obama years, just to pick another Democratic president. Except that my understanding of the political parties at the time was that they were not in any way similar to the political parties that we have today, that you had a lot more, say, liberal Republicans who would have been part of the New Deal coalition to some extent, et cetera, et cetera. You would have had, you know, conservative, you had conservative Southern Democrats who were, you know, against certain pieces or et cetera. Like the politics were very complex and very different. So the fact that you'd see Republicans overwhelmingly say, no, how dare you? take away our Thanksgiving, this is an affront to tradition, which is very much sounds like a mid-2000s, you know, war on Christmas, Bill O'Reilly sort of point of view. Uh, That really strikes me. I'm curious if you can explain that at all, Nicole. Yeah, I mean, you can see it in part like the the partisanship on the Republican side is spinning up for the 1940 election, right? That their anti-FDR-ness is peaking at this moment. But there had been a coalition forming against FDR that included some Democrats for precisely the reason you're talking about. There was an anti-New Deal Democratic wing of the Democratic Party, um, as well as the Republican Party, which certainly had some folks who were willing to go along with the New Deal. But by like the late 1930s, many more Republicans were like, all right, FDR has gone far enough. It's time for us to get a Republican in office. And so I think that's why you see such a a wide split with the Republicans and a narrower one with the Democrats, because you still have all those conservative Democrats who also want to sort of be like, how dare you, Roosevelt? And so this is it getting more like there's politicization. There's politicization because there's what I was saying earlier about, hey, everything is politics. But this is it really becoming a partisan identity issue. Like it was even less about the tradition or any sort of logic it was about if you dislike roosevelt here's a way to show it like we're going to focus on this one issue well that's exactly right especially with this issue which you can actually imagine a liberal left critique of what roosevelt is doing which is that he's bowing to business owners and commercializing this sacred holiday Mm -hmm. and moving away from the true meaning of thanksgiving but what you end up seeing is exactly this like there's the politicization of everything but then there's kind of like the electoral politicization of everything, and that's what you're seeing here. Right, which feels like it has such echoes or presages today so much, right? I mean, masks and everything is just filtered through 
high level partisan politics. Um, so as we start to wrap up here, Adam, I, I'm curious to just get your thoughts on this holiday in general. I mean, you said it was your favorite holiday because of the food, but you've yeah. also identified some of the things that really give us pause about this holiday. Um, you've done a really great episode of Adam Ruins Everything on Thanksgiving. So I just kind of, as we enter this week <laughs> each year, like where's your, where's your head at with this holiday? I mean, I, yeah, I love the holiday. I think that it's a holiday that we should have. I mean, every culture around the well i don't want to exaggerate but like harvest festivals where you get everyone together and you have a feast of certain foods that are special to that time of year are just a a wonderful part of human life <laughs> you know and they're they're great at a time to see family and all get together and like share a meal together and and you know i'm even getting into it this year we're not traveling so it's me and my girlfriend having uh thanksgiving at home in our own apartment it's the first time i've ever done that in my mm -hmm. life and i'm excited to cook a bunch of things i've planned the whole menu and we went shopping and you know got a couple turkey parts and gonna do all the cranberry stuff. i'm like okay i'll do this i'll do this variation but i'm gonna make this thing because my mom always made it and that that's very wonderful it gets me excited i think that we can do that without having to perpetuate like a mythical origin of the holiday that's wrapped up in certain stories that were politically advantageous to be told in the 1920s or 30s about, you know, the uh, America's relationship with, you know, indigenous people who the land was taken from. You know, I, I don't think we need to do both of those things like we can have an accurate view of those events and of the history of American colonialism and uh, genocide, to be quite honest, and also still have a harvest festival at the same time. And I think we can still call the harvest festival Thanksgiving and we can think of it as a chance to, you know, be thankful for the year past and to be generous and all those wonderful things. And it's also nice to have special foods you only eat once a year. Yeah. That's just a nice thing that we can keep doing. <laughs> And I have to say, like, the return to it simply being a holiday of gratitude instead of it being wrapped up in this mythology about peaceful colonizers coming through is a return to the origins, right? I mean, Thanksgiving as a holiday, as an idea, was about giving thanks. And it didn't have anything to do with these sort of, like, myths that have been built up around it. And so, yes. you know, I think we live in a culture where gratitude has taken on a new sort of, um, you know, it fits into mindfulness and wellness and all of those kinds of things. So I think that there's a, a good foundation here for a Thanksgiving that is less rooted in genocide, which I think we can all <laughs> agree is a better way to go about our holidays. Yes. Yeah. yeah. You know, I, I, I do think it is one of the, the last things we actually genuinely have to bring us together and potentially bridge some of the divides, not to get too, you know, hallmark here. But um, when I worked at WMIC radio, we would do call in shows all the time around Thanksgiving and just sort of the conversations you ended up having with your family, even family who you didn't see eye to eye with on politics or whatever. And it always felt like the one time a year where people genuinely could do that thing where they just sort of see each other as people. That's getting harder and harder and harder. And but most of our other opportunities to do that have fallen by the wayside. And I still think Thanksgiving is one that potentially could could do that. We need that. I believe that we need that. And, um, you know, food that you only eat once a year is a good opportunity to to try and have those conversations and thanks to zoom this year you can mute that uncle yes you can just always mute that uncle on zoom if you need to yes but you i know, why, why, why why do we always blame the uncle yeah why is it not the ants i i know there's a lot of ants these out days there it's definitely the ants that are getting radicalized <laughs> i like yeah. this hashtag not all uncles yeah. Yeah. Uh, but yeah you know not to harp on it too much but it does always kind of rub me the wrong way when you see those articles that are like how to talk to your uncle at thanksgiving about politics or whatever you know first off this assumption that the conversation is going to be a war or that it has to be really tough or that someone has to win or that you can't find other things to talk about at Thanksgiving. And usually the case is that if people don't see eye to eye politically, finding common ground on other stuff and remembering that you're family and that you're human beings, you know, that that's the way to connect. And then the talking about politics can maybe get easier from there and you can start to maybe bridge a divide or something. Yeah, I, I think... Uh... You know, I've long, long ago given up the idea of of divide bridging as being a goal. Right. But I think the goal I have is coexistence. There are different there are different people in America. They do not see eye to eye. Uh, a conversation over Thanksgiving isn't going to bridge it. You know, reading hillbilly elegy is not going <laughs> to is not going to help you out. 
you know, but instead you need to be like, hey, we all live in the same country. And what do we do next? You know, and and how do we and that's what a political system is about resolving that question is who which set of ideas and and which uh, set of predispositions run the country. But at the same time, you're still talking about your friends and neighbors and family yeah. members. And so it's an opportunity to be around those people and have to do that. You know, <laughs> I think it's I think it's worthwhile to be put in that situation and is better than you know doing it on Facebook, for example. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> well said. OK, we're going to leave it there. Adam Conover, thank you so much for doing this. This was really fun and happy Thanksgiving to you. Thank you so much for having me. Happy Thanksgiving. Gobble, gobble. Yes. And Nicole Hammer, thanks to you as always. Happy Thanksgiving. Thank you, Jody. All right. My name is Jody Avergan. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you soon.